Welcome to Natural Recovery from Suffering. I'm Scott Killaby. Dan McClintock and I developed KI, this work. You guys may not know Dan as much because he's, he's actually on social media, but he's often on my social media channel, and people come to my social media sometimes for me or the podcast, and it's unfortunate because the reason that I am co-developing and have been co-developing with Dan is because he is amazing, and people don't know that. And I don't, ju I don't just mean as a human being. I work with a few really good human beings, that's for sure, a whole team of them. But just in terms of Dan, what people don't understand is that he has a very, very deep wisdom and insight around things. I noticed that when I first met him, actually. And I'm not going to go into the story because he's going to be on this podcast. And by the time you hear this, he probably has already been on the podcast. But the reason I'm saying that is because I want people to pay attention to Dan as a teacher, a mentor. The only reason people aren't, if they aren't paying attention to him, is because they might not notice him on my YouTube channel or my Instagram or Facebook because it's like it comes through your feed, and if you don't recognize a face, you might just skip over it. But you might not realize it's my social media page, and he's on there. He and I have also created a Kilo Man series, which is K-I-L-O-M-A-N. Look for it on my social media pages. Kilo Man is a superhero who comes to basically, well, I'm not going to tell you what he does. But this is, like, to me, really good material. Dan and I are artists more than teachers, and we're just having fun. I mean, we've, we've developed inquiry. That's the art that we create. And now we're trying to, or having fun creating social media, teaching and mentoring and sharing and expressing. And I really want you guys to pay attention to Dan. I've actually... The people that we work with that help us promote the work, I've actually said to them, please highlight Dan as a teacher so that in 2024 and 25, people start to hear Dan and what he has to say. There's like a post-trauma teaching here where I don't need the spotlight, although I will use the people that have come, our audience, to help people, other people be heard. The people that have come to see me, I have other people that I want to show you because I want you to see that this is not about me. This is about the work. And I'm just one of the first vocal people. And there will be a, quite a few that are coming. You'll see, and Dan's going to be the first. And for some of you, you know, he's already been helping you because you watch his videos. Anyway, I say that because Dan and I, and he did, the, he has a couple of videos, I know one at least. By the time I did this podcast, I've seen one of his where he talks about a, like a case study. You know, like he'll say, I don't forgot the name of Paul is Paul is this and that and this and that. And he explains how emotional repression manifests in your life. And he explains it in very practical terms. By explaining what happens to Paul. It's not Paul, but it's a fictitious name. And that's what I wanted to do here. Because that's what we're trying to do together. Dan and me are wanting to express what we've developed here and show you the insights and show you how emotional repression and trauma drive suffering. And it's res responsible for a lot, if not its hands in all of our suffering. And it's buried and we don't know it's happening. And that's why Dan and I are so vocal and we do all this work out here in social media, whether people listen or not, because it's important work. It really is. So, <clears throat> tonight, I want to talk about Jack and Jill. These represent nobody, and it represents kind of everybody. Let's say Jack and Jill grew up in different households. Later on, they came to marry each other, you know, in like their 20s or something. But Jack grew up in a household in which he couldn't feel and express hurt or sadness. He had like a macho dad, you know, the type like who, you come on, son, be strong. You know, you don't cry on the baseball field. And 
all of his life, Jack, he, he didn't know why he was growing up feeling like he was alienated from his family. Like he would try to get dad's approval and it would never, it could never get it. And he kept trying and trying. And no matter what happens, he can't feel good enough in the eyes of dad. And then mom feels kind of aloof, you know, like she's not even really there. And so he doesn't feel emotionally connected to mom at all and can't connect with her. And dad is who he tries to get approval and love from because he's just, you know, dad, how dads are. And he can't. And so Jack is somebody who's never really, maybe a few times, really cried and felt the deep sadness in his body. And so by the, you know, by the time Jack is 18, he's got a big personality. You know, you've seen there's all kinds of people with more a bigger personality. Walk into the room and the way they talk is just very commanding. And, and that's, that's Jack. And, you know, through high school, Jack developed some addictions and was just partying at first. You know, was going out and drinking with friends on weekends. But it was like that was a reprieve for him from sports, you know, that he didn't really want to do. He was just trying to get dad's approval. Just go out drinking and just get crazy and chase girls and be popular. And then, but after high school, you know, Jack goes to college and now drinking becomes something more than like, just the weekends it's like thursday nights and then well why not just drink at night not during the day and study a little bit but don't drink so much during the week that you can't study or can't go to class starts out that way but the senior year he's barely making it to class he's drinking all the time he wakes up feeling like shit every day he has to drink just to maintain at that point by the time he's graduating college. But at one of the parties, he meets Jill. And she's like this amazingly beautiful and like this calm princess. So opposite to Jack. And they're just drawn to each other at some party that they meet, you know. And Jack's totally drunk and he's already big. And Jill's like, that's the man for me. <laughs> and he might be acting you know, crazy at the time that she says that, but that's what she likes. He's handsome and he stands out in the crowd and she knows that that's the one that she wants. And he sees her and there's something that happens there that's a connection that lasts for a long time. But it is not going to be smooth because Jill grew up in a different household and the two of them coming together is more than about two people just meeting. Yeah, you could say on the surface, it's almost like soulmates. The people around them talk about them like Jack and Jill, man. They're, they're like the perfect couple. But it's not the same inside the relationship because of how Jill grew up and how Jack grew up. So I'm going to tell you about Jill in the next segment and how she got to that night at the party where she met Jack for the first time. Stay tuned. Somehow Jack and Diane from John Cougar is in my head now. I'm really regretting that I didn't name Jill Diane. But then they'd have to go off behind a shady tree and like do something and I don't know what to do about that. Because they met at a party. <laughs> so <coughs> when Jill saw Jack, she didn't know why she was magnetically drawn to him. He didn't look like dad. No, it, but he was handsome. And she knew that, like the, the, the cutest boy ever. Now, Jill grew up differently. Where, as Jack could get angry, that was okay in the household with his dad. Um, Jill never could and never did. Her dad was angry. He drank a lot. Mom was just kind of there, but didn't give any sort of, like when dad would get angry, the mom would just sort of say, well, honey, just, just go to your room. He'll get over it. Kind of protecting her, but also sending that signal that, hey, don't, don't fight back. I don't. And, you know, dad's just in one of those moods. Just taught, you know, Jill, to, that anger is, does, is not the way in this family for her. Even though dad's that way, for her to get love here, she has to be quiet 
and be good, be, be peaceful, to just survive mom and dad. And she did, and she loved mom and dad. I mean, other than dad's anger, which was an issue, but she never understood how it affected her, she basically had a good mom and dad. She thought. She goes to high school. She's popular, some sports. She goes to college. She's not doing drugs and alcohol like Jack. She's a little bit more sober, more of a good girl. And the same thing in college. She's in the fraternity or the sorority that the good girls are in. But she drinks a little bit. And that night she's got a little bit of alcohol. And it loosens her up. And she says something to him. She walks up and talks to Jack. And that night it was over. <laughs> Once they talked. They were just magnetically drawn to each other. Where you saw Jack, you saw Jill. And vice versa. They became a couple who even isolated from others. They were so in love in the beginning. They saw good qualities in the other. You know, Jill was kind of just a little bit timid. She couldn't be like loud and fun-loving like Jack. And she found that really attractive. It was kind of like her dad because dad had some of those qualities when, you know, the anger too, but, but Jack wasn't angry. So she liked Jack. No, she loved Jack. And she was attracted to Jack. And he felt safe in some way, even though he was very different than her. Somehow she felt safe in the beginning and really fell for him. And he for her. And for a different reason. She was like that calm princess that he needed in his life to ground him. Because Jack had been drinking and is drinking every day. And he doesn't even want to tell her that. But he's drawn to her calmness because he knows that whatever I'm getting in the alcohol, maybe I can get that from her. He doesn't know what that is. Something is missing in him, though. And he knows it. See, because his trauma and repression has got him more than her at this point. Drinking every day. So there's a rescuing factor, too. And over time, Jill realizes that she can help him. And she doesn't know uh, that, that it's buried anger that is doing all this. I mean, she's just in love with Jack, and he's got some problems, and she can help. And she tries, but when Jack helps, he just resists that because he feels ashamed. And he doesn't want and can't be vulnerable with her because that's too close to hurt and sadness. So, you know, the whole drinking becomes a sensitive topic. And that starts to make them have difficulties after college and when they're still together. And, but they don't really talk about that. And Jill just looks at the drinking like, well, Dad drank. And at least he's not really angry. So I do love him. And maybe if, if we get married, he'll, he'll see how much I love him. And maybe he'll stop. And... Jack kind of thinks the same thing. I mean, I think I've met the girl of my dreams, and we're going to have a family, and I'm going to stop. But they get married, and he doesn't stop. And he drinks at the reception, even, and, and starts to show something aside of himself that she's never seen before. Somehow, now that he's married to her, another side comes out that night, even, and it scares her. He was really drunk at the reception and he yelled at her in front of a few people. And she felt the way that she felt when she was a little girl and she couldn't fight back. And the little champagne that she had in her body didn't help any. And she wondered, what have I done? Oh, is this, just a, this is just a fluke. He's just, he's just drunker than he usually is. Well, the next day happens, and they now they're married. And they brush that under the rug. I mean, that was the reception. Stuff happened. It was crazy. Just like she kept brushing a lot of things under the rug because she's not the kind of person that gets angry. And she gets love and approval by not getting angry and not bringing things up. And that's what she did when she was a little girl. That's what mom taught her to do. Just go to your room, honey. So when Jack and Jill were together and he would drink, 
she would just go to her room. She had her own room. And she started to feel what disconnection is like. Like in a really palpable way that she hadn't really felt since she was a kid in those moments when she felt really disconnected from dad. She couldn't say anything though. It was just safer just to hang out in her room while he's doing whatever he's doing with the TV and sports and really not even paying attention to her. Kind of like dad would do. But that's love for her. She hasn't known anything different other than to not know herself and not know that she's angry, not know how to love or even allow her own emotions. She's trying her best to love somebody who's disconnecting from her. And she doesn't know why he is. Just like she didn't know why dad would do that. And then Jack starts getting angry. Now they're married and it's not just drinking, it's it's yelling sometimes. And this, this turns the marriage into a completely different thing where now it, it becomes about more like survival. Not, not just go to your room, but like real survival. And neither one of them knows that it's the emotional repression because their systems and their conditioning has developed such that that's hidden from them so that they'll keep producing suffering in the relationship and not have to feel and express what's true to each other. And that's what's going on there. And it just gets worse and worse until, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Stay tuned. They get into a pattern of suffering, Jack and Jill do. And it's a, it's a comfortable pattern but there's a lot of suffering in it. And the pattern is, do not be real with each other. That's the pattern that had been there since childhood. So these have developed ways to make sure that doesn't happen. And so Jack has got, he's starting to feel guilty and shameful about the drinking and his getting angry. So when he gets sober, like in the morning, he wakes up and is like apologizing profusely. And at first she's like, oh my God, he, he loves me. He just has a drinking problem. And every morning he tells me that he loves me and I can feel it. I either feel like what remorse or, or regret or something that he's showing me. And then there's, it feels like there's love in there. Like, like he does love me. And then I feel safe when he does that. Jill's not saying this to herself. It's like her nervous system just receives it every day, no matter what happened the night before. And she goes about her business throughout the day like, like things are okay, you know, and maybe it won't happen tonight, or maybe it won't be as bad. And that's how she gets through the day. It doesn't, doesn't feel and express what's true to her, to Jack. That doesn't really come across her mind and she thinks you know well maybe if I just just love him and just accept him as he is and just be quiet here maybe he'll find his way and but Jack is like feeling bad every day even if he gets angry at night the next day it's the same same pattern of seeking forgiveness and they both feel better, but Jack is miserable inside. And he knows that he has to get help. And every day when he wakes up, when he says he's, he's sorry, he says, what can I do? I need to go get help. And they talk about it, and that helps her get through the day. He's going to get help. He loves me. And they get to focus on the alcohol. And in some way, that keeps them safe in some way. That's why they're still together, because they get to focus on that's the issue. It's not anything else. It's not that we can't really be real with each other. It's that Jack has a drinking problem. And he's owning it. And he loves me. 
And even though he gets angry at me like dad, he apologizes in a way that dad never did. All the time, Jill doesn't know that all of her responses and reactions or lack thereof to Jack come because she has to hold herself back. She has to hold her anger back. And she wouldn't even think that anger would have anything to do with her being healthy. That wouldn't come across her mind. She's focused on other things, not anger. See, by focusing on Jack, she can avoid the fact that she has the buried anger. She doesn't know that, though. She just thinks she loves him. She doesn't realize that by focusing on that, she's staying safe and, well, of course, getting love. She knows it, though. She doesn't know where it comes from. At the surface, it just feels like love, and it's a challenging relationship. Jack is trying different things. He gets on some medication. Maybe this will fix it. Maybe if I can just get my system regulated, I won't drink. Or, or if I do drink, I won't drink that much. And maybe I just won't get angry if I do. Maybe something will change here. And for a while, he, he does drink less. He's not really angry. He's quieter. And it's like he doesn't really feel much. And she sees that. But she doesn't speak up about that because it's better than the anger. Like if he's just drowning out of his, his emotions in some way with medication, somehow that's okay because it just wasn't working the other way. She has some concerns about it, but he doesn't say anything. And then he stops taking it. He doesn't know that in his system he has this sabotaging programming right with his hurt and sadness repression that says a lot of things. I'm wrong. I'm bad. I don't deserve to get better. I have to hurt myself. I have to hurt people. Whatever it says. But it's certainly not interested in the medication. The conditioning isn't. Jack tells himself that he wants to take it, but there's a sabotage there. His conditioning says, no, that, I don't want that. I want to suffer. He can't hear it. All he hears are the voices like, should I take my medication or should I just stop taking it? It's like, it's drowning out my emotions. I'm not sure about it. And he's sort of landing in these ideas about the medication and it, that distracts him from what's really going on, which is there's a sabotage being driven by the hurt repression. It's simply safer to focus in all these places than it is to feel and express what's true to Jill or to mom or dad or anyone else. His boss. When he gets off the medication, his anger's worse. It's like he's taking it out on her. Somehow he's blaming her for that. And if she brings it up, he feels a lot of shame. And he gets angry. And all she sees is like, well, he's angry. She can't really see the shame. He doesn't really show that. That's not something he can even express. It's just he feels it. And that consumes him, actually. The anger, he knows it's not really the issue. And he starts focusing on the shame. He's like, I think I found the issue. And medication can't really fix that. I just found some shame, and that's my core issue. And then he focuses on that for a while. And first he just feels the shame, and it just overtakes him for days and weeks. The alcohol helps, of course. And actually, the alcohol makes him feel ashamed, so he starts drinking more. It helps drown the shame out, and it makes him want to drink more. He stays in that for a while, thinking, well, at least I found my issue. I'm just ashamed. And I think I'm ashamed of the alcohol, and that's the whole issue. And then by focusing there, he gets to distract himself from the fact that really, no, it's just like the science says. It's your hurt repression, Jack. But it's repressed. 
And so whereas you focus on the medication to regulate the symptoms of that, that repression took over there. And then here came the alcohol and the familiar anger, because that's safer than the hurt. He doesn't know any of that. And neither does Jill. And she starts to feel like a victim, more than she's ever felt in her life. And feels like there's just nothing she can do. She's trapped here. She doesn't even know how to leave or what the first step would look like. And he's getting angrier. Because the dynamic between them is, is so different now. It's like that big energy that Jack had that was so attractive, she doesn't even see it. She just sees his anger. And the calm princess in Jack's eyes, she's like a bitter, disconnected source of his suffering in some ways. And she can, he can never be good enough in her eyes is how he sees it. He can't even understand his emotions at this point. He just has them. There's no consciousness or insight, really, other than, well, I felt shame. But what happens is they live on and on in this pattern, and eventually it gets so bad that he's got to go to rehab, or else, well, there's no rock bottom after where he's at. I mean, it's so low at some point. And he goes, and the shame drives him there. And he knows that, and he thinks that shame is the answer, because it's my core. It's, I'm ashamed of my drinking. If I can stop drinking, then I'll be fine. And the shame is driving me to rehab, so I trust that. But when I get there, he says, I don't know about this. Because they're talking about feelings. And I'm angry. So he talks, he talks about anger. That's what he's there to do. And now he's, he's not drinking anymore. And he tells them, this is the reason I was drinking, is because I am angry, and I've been angry all my life. And, yeah, I'm ashamed. But he can't really talk about that yet. That he keeps to himself, mostly. But again, just like his family, he's comfortable with the anger. And, and people like it in the 12-step meetings. Because they're like, that, I love his energy. And like he can really like rant and rave and just like, I wish I could do that. And they, they get to know Jack and they eventually he's like doing pretty well in the 12 step program he's got sponsors he's sponsoring people he's doing service and at home they're getting along better Jack and Jill are and you know Jill's feeling better about this it's like this this could actually be the right relationship this was just the alcohol that's all that was and so we fixed that and so now we're getting along so much better. She has hope. That goes on for a while, but because the hurt repression in Jack isn't being dealt with, and because Jill didn't even consider dealing with any anger repression, suffering isn't done there. And they're just at a pit stop. Stay tuned. So Jill gets involved with Al-Anon families, with people you know who are addicts. And she starts learning some things, too, about herself. Meanwhile, Jack is doing incredibly well in the 12-step program. And they have like this sort of parallel recovery tracks going on. And Jack is becoming a big shot in the 12-step program. And that big energy of his is just magnetic. He just goes up the ranks in the service. You know, and more and more people like him. He's a speaker. He's had like now four or five years clean. And and Jill's even had a few years of Al Anon and knows what boundaries are now. Can't really express them, but she's learning. She hears stories in the meetings, the Al Anon meetings, about how people have already been through this kind of thing three and four times. 
and that some of the wives or husbands had to just finally do their work and finally speak up and say no or leave. And she's like quietly nodding in her heart. That, that sounds healthy, but I, I don't need to leave because he's doing better. And that's what she holds on to in those meetings. It's like, I'm sorry you had so many issues, but we've only had one round here. We're not as bad as you guys. I'm just so glad that my husband is finally doing well. And I don't need to leave him, but it's so good to hear these stories. But in her heart, she knows. She knows something that, that she hasn't learned about life, but she can't face it yet. She keeps going to the meetings, though, and it helps her because Jack is more and more interested in like what he's getting out of 12-step. And even though they're getting along much better, they're not really connected. And she's longing for something. And she gets that at the Al-Anon meetings, some sort of connection that she could never really have. And they talk about vulnerability, and that's something that she can relate to because those emotions are okay for her. You know, anger is not. But, yeah, hurt, she, she's been hurt by Jack. And she starts to speak up about that in the meetings. And she's starting to get some love and approval, too. And it helps her. And it just makes her feel good about her emotional experience. You know, she could never really share with people like that. And, and now she feels like she's growing and she's healthy, and she is. Because it really is part of her process to share but Jack, he's just getting more into his ego, and she sees that. It's like, well, now he's doing the speaker thing, and he just thinks he's Mr. 12-step. And But, like, she sees behavior. Like, he's on the computer a lot at night, and she wonders, like, is that, is that what is he doing? And she starts to feel feelings of, like, rejection, and she wonders, is that porn or something? Has he just become a porn addict? But she can't say anything. She can never say anything about stuff like that. But she internalizes it. It's like that means something. And she feels it. She doesn't she can't confront it. She doesn't want to. She doesn't want to feel the pain, but that feels safer than actually what she might have to feel if she found out. So at the same time she wants to find out. And she starts to sneak around after he goes to bed and Gets on the computer and there it is. Shocking. Like, he barely touches me and then look at what he's watching every day. Yeah, we're nicer to each other, but he's not interested in me. This is what he wants. And she just falls into this deep despair. Sad, hurt. And those years in Al-Anon, she tries to muster the energy the next day to say something to him. She can't live with this quietly. This No, this hurts too much. And this is different. Like, they've both done work, and she's, she wants to muster up the energy to say something. And all those lines from the Al-Anon meetings go through her head, like, just say this, just, just say what you need to say here, speak your truth. It's like, but her system, like, no, I can't. I want to, but I can't. She has no idea it's anger repression. She's been told that it has something to do with other things in the meetings, things that have nothing to do with anger repression. So she has no sense of what that is. She just knows she can't. And when she asks people at the al meeting, why can't I? They say, well, honey, it just takes time to trust yourself. And other things that are true, but distract her from the anger that's buried in her body. So she can't get any real help there. And so she never really confronts that porn issue in the way that she wants to. It comes out and he feels shamed, totally ashamed, and he gets angry. 
like he hasn't gotten since he was drinking. And now he feels so much shame. He's been found out. He didn't think this was ever going to happen. And so the shock of that to his system, it just blows his ego. You know, the, the facade that he had, he, he thought that he was such this guy in, in, in recovery that everybody looked up to and would never think that he has this addiction. And now his wife knows. And worse than that, that's his wife. And he feels incredibly ashamed and has no idea that that's the hurt repression. See, it's just safer for him to just feel ashamed there and angry than it is to be vulnerable, express hurt. He can't even touch that. He's feeling shame. And he remembers that feeling. But he's already in recovery. He can't go to recovery for that shame. He's already there. And he can't tell the people at the meetings either what he's feeling. And he thinks it's just shame, but it's actually because he's never been able to be authentic with people. And all the stuff that he's doing in 12-step is just coming from repression and ego. And so he has nobody to turn to. When it matters to have somebody to turn to. And all he has is himself. And when all he has is himself, he knows what he does. And he drinks again. And this time, I mean, it doesn't take long before, I mean, the shit hits the fan like it never did before. Like, he doesn't just go to, like, he starts a little bit of light drinking, and then quickly it's just spiraled downward to, like, almost madness in the house for her. And she can't leave again. He's not going to meetings, of course. That's all ended. The porn, and he blames her for that, and he feels shame about that porn. And shame about the drinking. But he doesn't know that keeps him safe from the vulnerability that he buried. That that's the thing that hasn't been addressed since he was a little kid. Growing up with dad who thought that was weak. Or all those years of drinking where that hurt or sadness repression was driving the drinking and the shame. And that the shame created by that repression drove him to the recovery. When he was in recovery, he was getting a hit off of all those people who saw his false self, the big energy that protected him from the hurt repression. And so he really didn't get anywhere because now he's drinking worse than ever. He's angry all the time. She's just trying to survive. He goes to jail because he pushes her, hits her. She falls down. Somehow her friends come in and rescue her while he's in jail and somehow get her to file for divorce. And finally it ends. Not through any boundary that she set because she didn't know where all that was coming from on her side. So she couldn't set a boundary around the drinking or the porn or anything else. She didn't know how. So she really feels like a victim going through the divorce. There's just no, she's powerless. But at least she's getting away from him. No matter where Jack goes, Jack only has a few options. Wherever Jill goes, she only has a few options. 
Neither one of them have freedom. Both of them are going to do it again in some way. Because they didn't get to the repression that was driving all that. Even if Jill takes the option of more Al-Anon meetings or goes to therapy or even meditation or whatever to try to better herself, she's going to see that Prince Charming somewhere. And all of that's going to kick in again. Falling in love and all the things that come from that. And she'll probably keep going. She could keep going to Al-Anon meetings in every relationship and never really have a healthy relationship. Even though she hears that stuff, it doesn't matter because it's she can't. She can't truly be herself with anyone because she has anger repression. That's why she's going to Al-Anon. That's why she's falling in love with people that she can't be herself with to relive the trauma of her childhood. She just doesn't know it. But the only option that's going to help Jill really is to get to the repression. And then she's not going to need other people to tell her what to say or do or rescue her. Because she's going to be empowered with the resource that was always missing for her. With dad and mom. It didn't feel safe to be angry with dad. And mom said, no reason to do that, babe. Just go to your room. She learned how to suffer. Just forgot that she did it. And Jack, he can do any number of ins and outs with recovery. He can do 12 of them if he, want, if he wants. I mean, if that's what happens, he doesn't want that. But I mean, I've seen people go to rehab 30 times. And I've had someone come to my treatment center when I had it, who that was his 28th time, I think. And there are people who've gone more. But see, there's just a number of options for Jack, but none of them lead to freedom and love, what he really thinks he's looking for. Because he's not aware that it's re hurt repression. So he could go to medication. He could go back to 12-step. He could go to therapy. He could find another Jill and will. It won't matter, really. I mean, until Jack begins to be at least open to the idea that there's just something that he is resisting very deep down in his body. There's just something there. Until he becomes open to that, he just kind of has to manage that in any number of ways. And it's driven on fear. The fear of feeling and expressing what he's buried and the fear of getting hurt again or whatever that is for Jack when he was a kid. And that fear will dominate his life no matter where he goes or what option he takes because it's unprocessed fear driving his suffering. And the same with Jill. doesn't matter. She could get on medication. She can suffer as a victim. She might. Or she could go to therapy and try to deal with those feelings that she has of being like somehow she caused it even or somehow she's attracting this but she can't get to the root of it she has more than one jack in her life and the pattern just keeps happening in some way maybe one doesn't drink as much or one not at all but they have similar, something similar, and she keeps going back to. She doesn't know that she has to go within and meet that anger directly because she's chasing something. Love. And she can't find it outside of herself. She just doesn't know that. It's the anger repression driving that. How could she possibly know that? No one's telling her. Her therapist doesn't tell her. Any of the diseases that she has as she gets older, her doctors don't tell her that that could be linked to repression and what happened with Jack and the other Jacks. 
So everywhere she turns, she gets she goes back to Al Anon and they don't tell her that it's the anger buried. But somewhere maybe Jack or excuse me, Jill hears it, you know, and then another option opens up for her, just like it would for Jack. But until then, since repression drives it all, there's just a bunch of options that take Jill away from the root of her suffering. And even to the arms of other men coming from that deep sense of deficiency that she doesn't know comes from the emotional deficiency, the anger that's buried. Keeps trying to find something outside of herself that she'll never find. Until she goes to the anger that she buried. Even if Jack end up, ends up getting sober, he knows he has to do something different than get, just get approval from people in recovery. He would have to. We all do. If he has one moment, that's all he needs. That's all any of us need. If Jack has one moment where he somehow sees and that entire unconsciousness of, that he calls his life, which is really what it is, because the hurt repression, just like Jill, is driving him in every direction away from the hurt repression, you know, to anger, to drinking. Oh, it's really shame. Let me try some medication. What about this 12-step? Everything but hurt repression, see? But if he has one moment, just like if Jill had a moment, where he, he, he reads a magazine, or he listens to this, or he reads the science, or he develops chronic pain and reads about Dr. Sarno. Like, it doesn't matter, but one moment is all it takes for a lifetime of doing this to ourselves and not knowing that we're doing it. All it takes is one moment. One moment where you just stop bamboozling yourself. And you go, this is actually the root of my suffering, perhaps. And then your life changes. In some way, because you make that the focus. I would like to say, this story ends up like, Jack and Jill okay, come back together, and they've both done their repression work, and they're just like super authentic with each other, and like they knew that they always loved each other, and they, they came and did KI or some work like that, and... Like this is the most wonderful relationship that you can ever imagine and they walked into the sun together and, and now if you want to do this work, here's the products and here's the... <laughs> no, no, because life is life. So Jack might die if he doesn't get sober, right? Or he just might live a, a life of suffering or a life of recovery, but will there still be suffering, see? Because recovery doesn't mean we end suffering. Going to the therapist doesn't mean we end suffering necessarily. Going to the spiritual teacher doesn't mean we end suffering necessarily. So Jack's going to be managing, right? That's life. Managing safety. Managing hurt repression and not knowing he's doing it. That's more likely the how the story ends. And that's more likely to be you all, is what I'm saying, if you're like Jack and you keep turning away from what the science is saying and what your body is saying with regard to the root of suffering, or Jill in the same way. But what I've learned is, is that everybody has a right to be Jack and Jill, or Jack or Jill, or someone who represses all emotion and has no idea that that's the root of suffering. Why would I say that? Because if you really listen to this whole thing in a nutshell, you know, told in story form, each of us, in some way, alone, within, and as ourselves, have to have that one moment is what I've learned about getting to the unprocessed, the unconscious. It's a one moment thing, and I hope that some of you had it while listening, but
if you don't have that moment, what happens in life, I've learned, is that suffering continues. And that's not anything to gloat about. First, first of all, that someone doesn't have that moment where they see that it's emotional repression creating the suffering. Just a, even a glimpse. I actually have a lot of compassion for people who don't have that one moment. Because that was me. I'm Jack or Jill. What I've learned about that, people who live their life not knowing that how suffering is created, how they're doing it, is that there's a bubble that we live in. I mean, you could call it ego or whatever else, but just use a bubble metaphor here. That bubble is self-protective. I love the Carl Sagan quote that says, if we've been bamboozled long enough, if we present evidence to show us that we've been bamboozled, we may deny it. I would just add to protect ourselves. That's our bubble. And our bubble is our repression and our suffering. It's our reality that we create every day. That's our bubble. Your experience is your bubble. And if you know what your experience is made of now, by listening to Jack and Jill's story, you know that your bubble is like Jack's. It's like you have some repression. You don't know that unless you've been doing this work or similar work. And then you are probably going in all these directions away from that repression. Not knowing that the repression conditioning is driving your suffering and driving you away from it for safety and to get love. And so Jack and Jill is everyone. If you can look in your life, this can be the moment where you go, well, I can't see the repression. And I'll say, of course you can't because it's buried. But can you see all the evidence that Jack and Jill couldn't see? If you can see all the evidence, that's me or you should, I could say you, being presented or presenting yourself with that evidence. So will you deny that? Will you bamboozle yourself upon seeing this? It's up to you. If you're interested in starting the work, you can always go to repressiontest.com. Also, I always put in the description like some links to a taste of mentorship because we highly recommend that over anything because we think that we can help you the most by guiding you to learn the work the way that we developed it and then it works well. But without mentorship, if you're not ready for that, I'm going to put a link to a kind of do-it-yourself course, which some people like to try it to get started. Thank you so much for listening.